Hey, everybody, welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. Our month here of joy is winding down, but we still, still have some special events. Uh, let me clue you into some that are happening over the next three days. Uh, on Tuesday, May 30th, at 11 a.m., we have a panel called Late Fascism with Alberto Toscano, Nikhil Singh, and Robin Morasco. Alberto has a new book coming out from Verso on late, cap, cap, uh, late fascism. I've, I've seen it. It's wonderful. Uh, on Wednesday, May 31st at 11 a.m., uh, the legal crisis in Chile, oy vey, is all I can say with what's happening with the constitutional pro process now. That has uh, Gerardo Munoz, Rodrigo Carmi, and Ele Alejandro Castillo, uh, again, 11 a.m. on Wednesday. But uh, today, I am really happy to introduce uh, uh, Money and Capital in the 21st Century with uh, Paul Maddock, Jamie Merchant, and Tony Smith. Uh, uh, Tony will be our guide through this uh, labyrinth of capital that we're trying to navigate in the 21st century. Uh, Tony of, uh, teaches at the University of Iowa State at Ames, Iowa. He's the author of Beyond Liberal Egalitarianism, uh, Globalization, and also a wonderful article on Marx um, as a, a Lakotoshian research program in science. Uh, Tony, welcome to Red Night. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very grateful to uh, Red May for organizing this discussion. Uh, today, we're going to talk about money and its place in contemporary capitalism with two authors who have recently written very, very important books on this topic. Uh, Paul Maddock, uh, his book is called The Return of Inflation, Money and Capital in the 21st Century. It's going to be published by Reaction Books. And Jamie Merchant, uh, his book is called Endgame. It's going to come out in London uh, sometime next year. Now, we want to spend most of today uh, talking about contemporary capitalism, but it seems to make sense to begin on a more general level, more basic level, maybe, uh, and just talk about money a little bit. Uh, it's, there's hardly anything that's more familiar to us. It's one of the most everyday things in our lives. We can't go a day without dealing with it. Uh, and yet, you know, when we ask what it is, it turns out to be a pretty mysterious thing. Uh, so we want to think about what it is, uh, what makes money in, in capitalism different from any other type of society. Capitalism is not the first type of society to use money, but there's something different about money uh, in capitalism from any other period in human history. Uh, is, there's a familiar story that money is just there for our convenience. It's just another tool that we can use that helps us get the things we need uh, more efficiently. Uh, uh, does any of that mean? Now, this is really one of the big questions that Paul takes on in his book. So maybe we can be we can begin with Paul just talking about uh, how he deals with this in his book. Sure, and I, I'll try to be very short. Although, as as Tony just said, the thing about money is that it is both completely ordinary and everyday, and deeply mysterious and complicated in the way in which it is ramified throughout the workings of modern society. But the, the other thing Tony said, which is absolutely crucial, is that although money is a very, very old institution, um, it, has a, it is different in capitalism in its functioning than in any other mode of society. It plays a different role, and it is central to the functioning of our society in a way that it hasn't been central to the functioning of other societies, namely, almost a very large proportion of social activity, the activities of production and consumption uh, are mediated through the handling of money. So for example, even if you look at something like housework and which much the work is not actually paid for, it is, it is performed using materials that are bought in stores. It's performed in buildings that are paid for which rent is paid. So even if you look at the non-monetary aspects of life, money is always lurking there in the background and is central to the way in which it functions. Why is that? It's actually for, um, for a reason which is obvious once you step back and look at a capitalist society, because the fund a fundamental feature of capitalism is that most productive activity um, 
is carried out by people who are paid money in order to work for other people. Um, and money here play money therefore plays an extremely important function. In order to acquire goods, you have to have money in a mercantile system, such a, a market system like ours. But in order to get money, you either have to inherit it or somehow you seriously have it, or you have to work for somebody else who then pays you that money. So money is actually, while it appears to be a technology for mediating the exchange of goods between people, it's actually a technology for keeping people from having access to the goods that they produce. If I work in a bakery, I can't just eat bread. I have to earn money from the owner of the bakery, and then I have to buy back some of my own product. So the function, the chief and central function of money in capitalism is to prevent the people who produce goods from having access to those goods unless they agree to work for an employer another day or another month or another year. So money actually has the function of reproducing the, the class difference between people who own means of production and employ other people to work for them and the people who have to work for them. And that is really the, the, the key to understanding the both what capital is and what money is in a capitalist society. That money is the thing which, so to speak, it's the, it's the social mechanism that forces people to go to work every day, thereby reproducing the difference between those who own property in society and those who, and those, almost everybody else, who have to work for them. I don't know if you want yeah. to add something to that either of you. It's plenty to add. Uh, Jamie? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's, there is, uh, there, and yeah, in, in one sense, there is plenty to add, and, and in another sense, there, there isn't that much more from what, from what Paul said, in my opinion. Like, when we, when we drill down to get to, like, the essential, like, characteristics of money, the way that it functions in modernity and in capitalistly structured societies, what does that look like? How does it work socially, economically, and politically? I think I would just sort of put an exclamation point on something Paul said about, and, and, and Tony, you alluded to as well, that like, it's, I mean, money is a very ancient institution that has been around for millennia and that has had an extraordinary complex range of different forms and media and social arrangements behind it over the course of, you know, thousands of years. Um, it can it, it, it's assumed almost innumerable different uh, forms over that time and, it, and, it's, and it's taken all kinds of different, it's been embedded in all kinds of different social formations and patterns, but it's, it's only once the, the capitalist mode of production, I mean, I would argue, is, is sort of fully consolidated and fully remakes social relationships on the ground in the way that the majority of the population you know, no longer has access to the, the the means of reproducing themselves economically, the classically understood means of production. When all of the the, the collective labor of of society of global society is now mediated by this by this labor process and this regime of of labor control, and control over the productive system that money provides, it's only then that it comes to suffuse every nook and cranny of social life and at the same time to be totalized into this global you know, form of power that reaches across like international lines, transnational divisions to affect everyone in every country insofar as they're subject to the, you know, the whims of the, the ownership class who has all the money. So it's, it's, yes, it's that process of both sort of like totalization and seepage into ordinary everyday life that I think is really key for understanding the way that, or one thing that's really important for understanding mm -hmm. money and, and modernity. Yeah, there is, there are a lot of things to add, of course, when you, when you talk, get down to the details, like you say, I guess the only thing I'll add to this is just uh, how confusing it is uh, as a, as a, as a thing in our lives, right? Because on the surface level, it gives us some freedom and, and that can't be denied either, right? If you have some money in your pocket, you get to decide, whether you want to buy this or whether you want to buy that. Uh, 
And so when uh, Milton Friedman comes along and says capitalism is all about freedom, I mean, that, that, that resonates because we have that everyday experience. But the very thing that gives us freedom, uh, as you've both said, uh, is this external force that is dominating us in a very impersonal way. Uh, we think we can go about free to choose our own ends, but we're in this system where there's a pre-given end for the, for the society as a whole. Uh, money has to become more money. Uh, there has to be, in Marxist terms, capital has to be validated, uh, has to be valorized. Uh, uh, we have an initial amount of money, then we have to end up with more money at the end of it. And this, the whole society is sub subjugated under that imperative. So the very thing that gives us a type of freedom also subjugates us. And, and to keep both of those things in mind at the same time is part of the reason why it's so hard to get a handle on capital. Um, okay, so why don't we move from that to, and talk about uh, today, get to the discussion of contemporary capitalism. And certainly one of the most striking things today is just how crazy some of these monetary variables have become, some of these numbers. They're just absolutely impossible to conceive. So if we, you know, just the number of the total amount of debt in the capitalist economy. Now, there's been debt from day one in, in you know, Back to the Assyrians had some sort of debt, uh, but the, but the total amount of debt in the global capitalism today, I think, is something like two hundred trillion dollars. So that's like two hundred with nine zeros after it. Uh, that's an incommensurable, uh, unimaginable magnitude to try to get our head around. Uh, if you look about the value of financial assets, uh, I think between two thousand and two thousand twenty-one, there's been a hundred and sixty trillion dollar increase in the value of financial assets. Again, just an unimaginable number. Uh, if you look at central bank uh, pumping money into the economy, uh, I think for the last COVID period, there was like $15 trillion pumped into the global economy. And again, this isn't in the history of capitalism about any of that. Uh, so, I mean, every generation thinks it's in some unique period of time, but there does seem to be something really unique about this period. And if you look at some of these monetary figures, they, they certainly give a sign to that. And both of your books sort of really take that on board, right? We need some narrative. We need some way to understand how did we get here so that these money numbers look so crazy, not just relative to other periods in history, but relative to other periods in capitalism. Uh, so maybe, Jamie, you could begin. That's certainly a dominant theme of your book is just trying to understand how we, how we got here. Yeah. I mean, one of the most interesting, like, additional facts to the the wild monetary statistics that you were just listing tony is that if you sort of follow the trajectory of the so-called advanced economies right after the, the big crash of 2008 2009 when the regime of monetary expansion really got really got going and sort of really the, you know the central banks of the world really kicked it into full gear and with you know quantitative easing and all of that the if you you know if you put that that arrow going way way up astronomically in terms of like the sheer amount of money and credit that's being injected into these economies next to the the rates of global gdp growth just like the crudest measure of growth that we have right real gdp or otherwise i mean it just that line is just going down for the you know for the united states for europe for japan like even for china after like you know 2015 2016 or thereabouts and so you have this global trend of tremendous monetary expansion and inflation in the in the money supply not necessarily talking about prices but of the money supply uh, happening parallel to the, the continual degradation in the rates of growth, of national growth, for the, the core of the global economy. And so that's, that's a sort of key fact for understanding, I think, why these monetary experiments are getting larger and more drastic and more uh, just, just huge over time is because the the sort of running of national economic policy has largely devolved into the area of monetary policy. This is changing now over the last couple of years. They're trying some new experiments with this new like switch to fiscal policy in the US and or into this new industrial policy. We could maybe talk about that later, but for the better part of like 
you know, most of the neoliberal period was all about what the central bank can do or can't do to restart growth. And the one sort of channel like they had and the lever they could pull was the interest rate, you know, manipulating the interest rate through the deposits that they um, take or give back within the banking system and that they hold at their in the central bank itself of all the, of the private banking system, influencing interest rates through that method um, or just outright increasing the amount of central bank money in the private banking system and in the and in, for example, in the US in the, the Federal Reserve system. And so just, you know, juicing the level of deposits across the board for all of the financial institutions in the hope that they are going to lend in order to kickstart growth, capital accumulation, employment, all those good things. But as we know, that that never happened, right? From beginning from sort of 2009, 10, when they began to experiment with these kinds of policies up and up to the pandemic, when things began to change, none of that was moving the needle on, on the investment rates and the, the rates of you know capital and production in these in the advanced economies. And uh, as a result, um, productive enterprise or, or, you know, capitalist enterprises that employ like large numbers of people were not being started. Investment was not happening. And the vast majority, a lot of that extra credit and sort of money that was um, injected into the system sort of just went to, toward the inflation of financial assets. As we know, it's not the, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? But uh, it would be hard, I think, to dispute that the astronomical rise in financial asset values that we've seen over the last couple of decades um, is unrelated to the like basically zero interest rates, right? That the central banks are maintaining. So, so none of that worked to kickstart growth in a more investment-led direction that would increase employment, that would stabilize social relationships, right, and and sort of pacify. Um, the, the the working classes in a in a way that you know the the ruling class and the political class who 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 tries to or you know order things on their behalf would be happy with, and I think especially the events of uh, 2020 like the pandemic and 2021 um, when the uh, Trumpist mobs stormed the Capitol in D.C. I think those those events really sort of you know made the the policy elite realize they had to try to do something maybe diff a little different from from business as usual to get things going again. But all of the my I mean I guess like the to put a bow on it the the tremendous rise in financial asset values and just the sheer quantity of credit and the money it's based on in the um, financial system over the last decade and a half or so uh, is, I would argue, you know, directly related to the continual stagnation and uh, degradation of the rates of growth in the advanced capitalist economies uh, over that same period of time. Um, and it, in a way that it was a response, it was a failed response, essentially, to, to that pattern, among other things. Paul, in your book, uh, you, you 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 give an explanation for what's happened. The, the two things that Jamie talked about. We have financialization on the one hand. We have low rates of investment, low rates of growth in the economy as a whole on the other hand. Uh, and as Jamie said, these two things are very much connected. But in your book, you give a historical narrative of how they were connected and why they got more connected as, uh, uh, today. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure, because I, the, the phenomena that Jamie is talking about are actually the, 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 the pair of phenomena that go together and that do explain the situation that you began by describing, the enormous rise in credit. So if you look at it historically, you could say that for, for the first part of the existence of capitalism, um, the the extension of credit, the making of loans, um, plays a relatively constrained role in the functioning of the capitalist system. It's always been essential because running a business is, is, a, is something that takes place in time. So you have to 
pay people every day. You have to buy raw materials and then they make something. And then maybe a year or two years later, you sell it and you get the money back. But in the meantime, you need to buy more raw materials and hire more people. So you borrow money. So uh, banking and the extension of credit to business has always been a, 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 an essential part of capitalism. It's what makes possible the expansion of the system. And it's, it, it allows it to expand and contract uh, cyclically, which it has been doing since the early 19th century. But there is a real change after, in the period since the Second World War, that there is right after the Second World War, a, a 30 years of enormous prosperity in which there is a lot of investment all over the world. Um, there is um, governments play a very important role because you had you um, the American government in particular had to finance the the recreation of the world economy after World War II. Um, but basically, the system was as once was a self-sustaining system. Uh, operating as capitalism is supposed to operate. But by the 1960s, this uh, tendency that Jamie was talking about, a decline of investment, was already beginning to manifest itself. And there was already a, a lot of talk in the mid-1960s among economists about the decline in profitability of capitalist business. Uh, and of course, that it makes sense because Capitalists, as you said, Tony, invest money in order to make more money. If profits go down for some reason, there will be less investment. And in fact, that is what began to happen in the, in the mid to late 60s. By 1973, that produced a, a major recession, the first major recession after the, the Great Depression of 1929. And at that point, one could observe a, a major change in the history of capitalism, which was this. Up until that moment, capitalism was, was characterized by a cycle of boom and bust periods. You would have growth, and then you would have a sort of depression, and then you would return to a period of growth. And without going into detail, you could say, just looking at it empirically, there seem to be some, there must be, or there seems to be some relationship between the bust period and the successive period of growth. But by the, by the, by the 1970s, actually by already the 1940s, the ruling classes of the world were no longer ready to deal with the social consequences of depression on the scale which they had already experienced in, in 1929, which had led to enormous social movements all over the world and ultimately to a second world war. It's the only way of readjusting economic spheres of interest among the major capitalist nations. So they were not willing to allow a return to the depression conditions. And in order to avoid that, you had to have an enormous expansion of credit. The governments had to borrow money in order to spend money to hire people. And they also spent, and or just to feed them. And um, banks had to be allowed to lend money to um, investors in the absence of sufficient rates of profit to justify um, normal investment behavior. And that has really been the story from, I would say, from the, from the, from the 70s to the present, that there has been, as Jamie said, statistically, you can see a steady decline in investment, a steady decline in growth rates that goes through the cyclical movement of the economy. Uh, and this sort of everybody sees and everybody recognizes, you know, for example, if you look at the, the uh, you know, even, even official economic, um, official economists attempt to describe what's going on, point to the problem of insufficient investment. This is widely recognized to be the major problem afflicting the world economy. And of course, the problem is that simply making money available in the form of bank credit or government 
uh, borrowing um, does not lead to investment. So that money went somewhere else. It went into the inflation of asset values. It went into the inflation of real estate. It went into the rise in gold prices. It went into the stock market. It went into the bond market. But none of that solves the problem of actually uh, of a declining rate of growth in the economy. And the decline and the it is the economy's growth which ultimately has to pay back all that those trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars which are created by governments and banks in advance. And you can see that 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 problem is constantly being solved piecemeal, both through the um, the bursting of all the various bubbles, like the dot-com bubble of 2000, or the, the current banking, banking crises is another example, or the um, cutting in half of Mr. Gautam Adani's, Adan's, uh, 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 Adani's uh, company values in, in a one week period, and also in the declining standard of living of the working population, which appears in the popular press in the form of the growth of inequality. That what you have is on the one hand, the accumulation of money in the form of debt in the hands of business people. But on the other hand, since somebody has to pay for it, you have a continuous chiseling away at the living standards of uh, the working population. So that inflation, you could say, to put it at its crudest, is, is a way of transferring income from workers to capitalists. That is its main function, and it has been its main function since the Second World War. And it's why you have um, you had an enormous increase in inflation in the 70s when the crisis period, the uh, crisis phenomena re reappeared, and why you now have the mysteriously unsolvable problem of inflation, uh, because it continues to be necessary to extract money from um, the, the uh, wage earning population simply in order to maintain. The, the, the system in existence at all. Yeah, um, now when we talk about the... No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> when we talk about the contemporary economy and what makes it different, of course, that's, that's immensely complicated. But one thing that strikes me is that if you look in past periods of really dynamic growth in capitalism, like the so-called golden ages, uh, they've, they've been periods where there was a region of the global economy that had a massive advance, uh, you know, a massive lead over other regions uh, in terms of productivity, technology, science, uh, innovation in general. Um, if you look at the Netherlands and then England and then the United States, like in their golden dynamic periods, it took it would take other parts of the world like 50 years to catch up. And when they eventually, and so the key to capitalism, I think, is that, uh, it, you know, it's not just making innovation. It's like how long you get to enjoy an innovation over your competitors. And in the really dynamic periods of capitalism, uh, the, the, the units of capital, the regions of capital that had big advance, uh, advantages were able to enjoy those advantages for decades and decades and decades. And what seems different about our world is that there are all these national innovation systems that are pretty effective, right? The United States has a good one, but so does Germany, so does Japan, so does increasingly, so does China, much to everybody's dismay. And what that means is no units of capital, no regions in the capitalist world system can really enjoy a competitive advantage for an extended period of time. Uh, just because others can catch up, because others have good national innovation systems too. So how do you get profit? How do you valorize your investment when you can't enjoy a, 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 a competitive advantage for an extended period of time? Well, you can do it if you have a more ruthless war against labor than other countries. Uh, you can do it if you can impose an intellectual property rights system on the global economy, because then even if others can catch up, you can stop them from benefiting from it and you can maintain your competitive advantage. Uh, or you could do it in the way Paul described and, and put your money somewhere else than it. so what we have uh, uh, in the fine and so we have financialization and so we have this weird economy where there's a handful of companies uh, in this in the industrial sector the non-financial sector 
Uh, and they're all the ones that have tremendous amounts of intellectual property rights. And so it's not that other companies couldn't catch up to their uh, technologies. It's that we have a property rights system imposed ultimately by the U.S. military that prevents them from doing that. And so there's only going to be a handful of companies that get to enjoy that dynamism from the innovation today. Uh, and so, like Paul said, all this other money that's out there to be invested, it has to go somewhere else. And so I think that's one thing that is very different about our economy and that is, you know, explains a lot of why it so, looks so weird. Uh, and, and if you think what would change that, well, you know, if a world war <laughs> took out the national innovation system of China or Germany, then we could have another golden age in the United States. Uh, but short of that, it's hard to see where the dynamism is going to come from. Um, which brings us to the question of policy. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Paul, you, you, you raised the issue of inflation. It seems like the number one policy objective of the powers that be in the United States today is to control. Uh, and that that, uh, and, and as Jamie has described, they also want to sort of get the economy going again by going to something more, a more aggressive industrial policy. Uh, these two policies seem to have some tension with each other. Um, Paul, may, since this is such a topic in your book, maybe you could just go into a little more detail tell about how you evaluate this, uh, you know, the present, the present obsession with getting inflation under control, the politics of it. Uh, anything more to say about that than what you've said already? Yes, yeah, just, well, that's a lot to say about it, but to be brief, <laughs> there are two, <laughs> I, I see two aspects that are worth emphasizing. One is that the people who run the world don't actually understand how it works. They really don't. I mean, it may be hard to believe that, but they actually have no idea how their system works. If you read economic policy or economic theory, it's nonsense. They, they literally don't understand how they don't really understand what money is and how it works or how it fits into the society. And so they have the they because in, in normal in academic economic theory, Money is just a technology for facilitating the exchange of goods between owners. That's, they, they actually believe that. So then they think, oh, uh, if, there are, if there's money problems, then that somehow can be solved without affecting anything fundamental in the operation of the social system as a whole. They, these are money problems. And so you have specialists in money, the, the bank, the bankers, the, the, the central bankers, and they're supposed to solve this problem, which, and of course, they actually can't do it because the problems aren't money problems. The problems are problems of low profitability and low investment as a result. So part of the story is that they actually believe that they can somehow control the system by manipulating uh, the money supply, but it, it always turns out that they don't really succeed in doing it as they wish. The other part of it though, is that even though they don't really understand their system, they have to operate with the system as it actually exists. And the way in which the system actually exists is that what profit there is comes from the exploitation of labor. And that means that if you are in a period of very low productivity growth in which it's very difficult to increase the productivity of labor, the only way you can increase profitability is to decrease wages. So that is being accomplished on a global scale, partly through these monetary changes. So you have, that explains the completely bizarre, you know, um, situation in which the economists and the policy, the money policy people say, we need to fight inflation by creating more unemployment because there is a real danger of a wage price spiral. But in fact, there is no such danger. Wages are way, way, are, you know, have, have risen much more slowly than prices. They, wages have been stagnant or declining for 50 years. There's no, wages are not the, the, the origin of inflation. Everybody can see that. Anybody who looks at the data can see it. And in fact, it's now even publicly recognized more and more that actually companies are just raising their prices. That is, that is why prices are going up, not because workers have managed to raise their wages. But nonetheless, that's the only thing they can do is to try to lower wages even more. 
So on the one hand, the companies try to solve their problem by raising their prices. On the other hand, the government, government banking authorities tries to raise, uh, try to lower wages by increasing unemployment. Even though that conflicts, as you pointed out, with the other story, which is the attempt to compete internationally with other uh, industrial centers through this new so-called new economic policy, which maybe Jamie, I know has been thinking about this a lot. So maybe you want to address that directly. Yeah, I'm happy to, but uh, Tony, did you have anything to add to? No, I mean, I'm, I'd like to hear what you say too. <laughs> yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I think while, of course, I, I agree with, with Paul's analysis of the the monetary officials and the like the way that they that what they actually believe money is and how that that belief is a you know turns into a real force through the way the, the decisions that they make to you know govern the economic system um un, under those concepts um they it, it's it's based on that systematic misunderstanding of what the what the role of money is and of course much less like the necessity of reproducing class to reproduce the economy but nevertheless, they do, they do get more desperate over time, as they see and they and more willing to sort of, in a pragmatic spirit, experiment and and carry out new kinds of make new kinds of you know practical choices that you know are quite different from the ones that they've made before in an effort to you know just basically try to get the situation under control because nothing else is is working you know and I would argue that's that's what we're seeing now with the the turn not just in the US by the way pretty much globally in all the major powers to yes like this new paradigm of industrial policy which not that long ago i mean 5 or 6 years ago would have been dismissed as as you know pure nonsense by the establishment uh, you know just like the relic of a of an older and more benighted time before you know before globalization and before this more enlightened understanding of you know, the universal benefits of of open and liberal trade between all lifts lifts up all parties and um, that turned out to be completely false. So what we have now is this sort of what seems to me at least to be an epochal moment where the U.S. is has essentially decided that they're willing to blow up the the global political order that they constructed in the aftermath of World War II. And within the environment of the, you know, the emerging Cold War and all the relationships and alliances that were formed in that period within the, the umbrella of the Bretton Woods system. And we can talk more about those kinds of concepts if, if people, if, or, if, or if viewers would like us to. But the idea was that under this U.S.-centered international system of free trade, first in the Western non-Soviet bloc and then in the entire world, right, like open trade. At, with uh, like open trade regimes and liberal uh, trade policies and open capital flows, liberal labor regimes too, of course, we're going to allow the U.S. sponsored system of international political and economic governance to sort of just continue along and eventually allow developing economies to grow and become wealthier. And this was the idea, right, during the so-called like neoliberal period. That event over the last two or three years, basically, the policy elite has decided that that story is false, and they were wrong to have believed to have believed it. You know, like that's they do come to conclusions of this kind. You know, where they're like, "Well, that was that was plainly wrong," but because they have a completely uh, a completely inadequate sort of conceptualization of the way the the main relationships of the system is, uh, how they work, of the system that they supervise. You know, they just they jump to the uh, the total opposite end of the spectrum, which in this case is just sort of raw economic nationalism, where now the idea is, you know, and U.S. is the U.S. is leading the charge in this, is that you simply destroy your competitors economically by, you know, by leveraging in the U.S.'s case, it's immense um, monetary seniorage powers and it's its ability, you know, it's it's privileges as the custodian of the world's global reserve currency, the dollar. And it's just overall sort of political power to more directly subsidize mostly manufacturing industries 
and 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 a lot in the sort of like you know post carbon clean energy space uh, in an attempt to jumpstart employment and investment and profitability and productivity uh, labor productivity largely at the expense of its so-called allies in in Europe and Japan and South Korea um, who were very upset you know when the the so-called in inflation reduction act was passed last year and essentially just signaled to the world that you know the US was giving up on on liberal internationalism for all intents and purposes and is and it was ready to just sort of um, pull the playbook of the 1950s back out again when the there was sort of more of a you know, however atrophied sense of like uh, the state and the government's responsibility to cultivate like strong and consistent growth. And there was more of a sort of willingness to, you know, to, for, the, for the state sector, for public investment to play a role in that. They're trying to sort of retrieve a little bit of that legacy and, and reactivate it for, for the present, but under very different conditions where, you know, the, the buildup and the, the concentration of, of industry uh, at the global level and the, the the sheer amount of investment that it takes to to compete industrially at the sort of like the the frontier of, of global productivity and manufacturing right requires just you know astronomical amounts of, of of investment and huge amounts huge amounts of money and you can you know so not it's not open to obviously to to any um, certainly emerging economy or, or otherwise to just jump into this fray. Um, and industrialized in the old kind of development sense. So because it's not, it has not been profitable to manufacture in, in the United States, you know, much, much less like emerging economies, um, they are now trying to, as it were, like artificially make it profitable through the direct intervention of the state and the government by, you know, giving these huge subsidies to um, people to buy electric cars, huge subsidies to like, um, people who like companies that want to come in and manufacture batteries, for instance, and in that way, try to jumpstart the, the sort of investment, employment, growth paradigm in, in that way. But as, but as I mentioned, it's, you know, it's, it's very much we're, we're in because the, what we're dealing with is not a bunch of independent nation states necessarily with their own like coherent, forms of growth competing separately and autonomously, autonomously with each other, but rather a, a one transnational system that is slowly becoming more and more anemic in its ability to, to produce the level of profitability growth that's going to allow it to expand. What we have now is like an increasingly zero sum situation, right? Where uh, high end productivity growth and industrial investment and manufacturing, you know, export led growth in some countries is is really going to come only at the expense of of other countries and so that's that's where we're in that's that's where we're at now that's what the new industrial policy means and so the us is finding it very difficult to sort of implement this kind of policy and at the same time maintain its its quite shaky you know anti-china alliance that it has constructed internationally and and done its best to sort of coerce you know kicking and screaming like countries like germany and south korea into mo mostly against their own interests and you know that political objective and the economic industrial policy objective are kind of um in conflict with each other right because those countries are very unhappy with the direction the united states is going and you know they put on a happy face at the, like the g7 conference that as, as you probably saw recently and a big show of unity and everything but like these the, the like the contradictions and the ten, the the tensions between the the great powers are in no way gone you know they're still very much there so we'll have to see how that turns out you know i'm pretty skeptical that they'll be able to sort of hold everything together but that's how it seems to me yeah and these things are of course connected uh, the connection there is a connection of course between the inflation inflation rate uh idea and raising the rate of uh, raise the rate of interest in order to get keep inflation down uh, and economic nationalism, right? Because raising the rate of interest in the global economy is just going to have horrific effects on lots of nations, right? We can already see African countries that are just going to be utterly devastated uh, by trying to roll over their loans at higher rates of interest. Uh, so, so I mean, interest rate policy can also be a weapon in uh, international geopolitical struggles like you're talking about. 
Um, I mean, I just wonder where what's going to happen next in terms of all of this, because in a way, uh, and, and you both talk about this in your book, in a, in a way, in, in the typical way capitalism worked, uh, I think Paul mentions this, right? If, if you look at capitalism in the 19th century going into the 20th century, between something like a third of the time to a half of the time, it was in depression. So, so we, we had this major global slowdown in the 70s. Uh, we did not have a depression. And we did not have a depression partly because of the incredible amount of money that was injected into the economy, the incredible amount of credit that was injected into the economy. It didn't give us that much growth, uh, didn't give us much advance in productivity, certainly didn't do much for the average worker, uh, but it, it stopped the depression. So in a way, we've been deferring a depression that could have would have happened in ordinary capitalism uh, for, for decades and decades decades and decades. And so we haven't talked about zombie capitals, which is a concept that both of you talk about in, in your book. Uh, now, there's a technical definition where a zombie capitalist firm uh, can't meet its interest payments without borrowing more, uh, you know, without more borrowing to meet the interest. Um, and s s somewhere between one third to one fifth of units of capital, the biggest units of capital are zombie capitals in that sense. But in a wider sense, if you say a capital that would have died if it hadn't been for this extraordinary infusion of debt and credit, then really all capitals could be zombie capitals. And, and well, raising the rate of interest in order to uh, deal with inflation, uh, just start destroying zombie capitals on some unimaginable scale. Uh, so that this economic nationalism that we talk about, it's just going to be even more desperate, right? A more desperate chance to keep your capitals alive any way you can, uh, because the what's what's kept the zombie capitals going for a long time is no longer going to work uh, in, in the very near future. Um, well, anyway, just a comment. I don't know if that makes resonates or makes any sense. Well, for one thing, it's not, it's not just the future. Um, the bankruptcy rate is rising very rapidly now in the United States and also in Europe. Yeah. And it's it's the zombie capitals because what made zombie capital possible was extremely low interest rates, uh, interest rates which in some places were actually negative interest rates. You you made money by loaning, you know, by, by borrowing money. So when you raise the interest rates, you inhibit the further extension of credit and those many of those zombies are now beginning to go out of business. Um, so that is, you know, that's something that you can say, you can already see what the, what the effects are. But, you know, I would say, I, you know, to answer your general question, which I think is a very, it, it's, it's a really interesting one. There is, in a way, they're stuck. They're really, you know, there is that famous old left-wing phrase, the contradictions of capitalism. But, it, there really are contradictions of capitalism. They really are stuck. These are, I think these are really insoluble problems. For example, the kind of issue of nationalism and na national industrial policy in the face of a global economy, a transnational economy that Jamie is talking about. You can see, it was a very interesting interview in the Financial Times the other day with the, uh, the guy who runs NVIDIA. The, the chip company that just reached a trillion dollar stock market valuation because they make the chips that are used in AI. So right now, everybody believes, oh, AI is going to save capitalism. But this also isn't going to work. But nonetheless, that's where everybody's rushing to make at least short term money by investing. So and he said, you can't decouple from China. China is 30 percent of our market. They said, you, you know, you you can build a chip factory in the United States if you don't want to buy Chinese chips. But you can't build another, he said, there's only one China. <laughs> you know, so it's just nonsense. You cannot say, oh no, you're not allowed to trade with China because then we'll go bankrupt. You know, so that's really the problem. That's the situation they're in. You know, that there is this one Dutch company that makes the equipment which you need now for the most advanced kind of computer chips. And they, the Americans are saying, no, you can't trade with China. But China is probably their biggest future market. So they will have to trade with China or else they will have to go to war with America. So I think they're really now in this. You can see the Americans themselves are going back and forth. 
No, we're not decoupling, we're de-risking. You know, if we're not really breaking up the whole world economy, we're just trying to get a move away a little bit. And you can see, they just don't know what to do because they have to compete. And they, they actually, as you were saying now, there's, they have to destroy the, uh, the industrial capacity in other countries. You know, the, the emerging company, countries don't matter, I think. Africa and all those people, they can just, they will just pump out the oil and steal the minerals and a few uh, gov government leaders will have Swiss, big Swiss bank accounts and everybody else will just have to die. That's just, that's just like they're going to die from heat stroke or starvation or whatever it is. But the real struggle is between the developed countries, which now include China, and they are afraid. You know, on the one hand, they, they are, do not want to have nuclear warfare, which will also not lead to a, a flourishing global economy. I think they probably understand that. But on the other hand, they can't all survive. Somebody, you know, so we will have to have a deep depression. And to answer you the question you asked before, what would what would allow a return to capitalist prosperity? You would have to really go through a deep depression and probably global war in order for those few corporations to emerge, you know, but it's even hard to imagine what that could possibly mean at this point, because now they have destroyed the earth to such an extent. And, um, you know, they have really developed the capitalist economy to the point where it's, I find it very difficult to imagine that it has a future. This is why I like very much the title of Jamie's book, End Game. I really think we, this is, you know, if the, if the economy doesn't sink, it definitely global the climate change is going to destroy the system. They're, 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 is, you know, they're not going to be able to survive the complete destruction of the world's food supply and mass heat death. And, you know, they, they are not equipped to deal with this kind of problem. As you can see, they, they are unable even to slow down the rate of carbon dioxide emissions, which are in, is increasing all the time with all the yakking about the green economy and electric cars. Now they can force people to buy, try to get people to buy a new kind of car. But in fact, emissions are going up all the time. So it's uh, they can't even do that because that would destroy the world's largest corporations, which are, if you look at the world's largest corporations in terms of revenue, automobile companies, banks, and oil companies. So they're not going they're not there's not going to be a green revolution. They just can't do it. And so I think we are now it is a historical turning point. I know Marxists always like to say this. Oh yeah, it's now capitalism is not as near the end is near. Uh, I don't know how near it is, but you can see the I think you can see the end. And I think the people who saw the end 50 years ago, they saw through a glass darkly, but they were right. You know, this is not a system which is going to go on for another 200 years. It's not possible. Uh, okay, well, maybe we should end with that. I just uh, want to make one brief comment before we go to questions, which is that uh, a lot of people on the progressive left, uh, it seems to me they take the wrong message from what's gone on with money in the last decades, right? And so they look at all this money that the central bank has created out of nothing and, and ordinary banks have created out of nothing. And they say, well, why can't we just create money <laughs> and use it to have a green revolution? Use, use Just create money out of thin air and use it to create full employment. Use it to create good jobs at good pay and all that. Uh, and that gets to uh, and, and you can see why that would be intuitive, because capital does get to create money and does get to use it for what it wants. But I think both of your books uh, really, they, they really go to a very deep theory of what the state is and what the money creation process is that the state allows and doesn't allow. And I think they just really are books that people who are progressive, but sort of buy into the idea that that we can reform this if we just get enough political control over it and we can use the central bank to deal with environmental problems and deal, create full employment at good jobs and all that. Uh, you know, it, it would be nice if any of that were true, but it just isn't true. And the capitalism we're dealing with is much more brutal and what it has in store for us, as Paul just sketched there, is really a horrific future, uh, environmentally and economically, in the, in the very near future. Uh, if, if we don't 
but learn what the system is. And I think both of the books that you just, that the two of you have just written are really great places to, to get an understanding of that. So maybe we should open it up now. We have uh, uh, you know some time left to talk to uh, deal with questions. I don't know quite how that system works, but um, maybe we should stop and let the people who know take over. <laughs> Hey guys, so uh, really illuminating talks. Uh, I will look through, I have a question of my own and while I ask it to you, maybe I, I can gather ones from the, the comments to see whether they're good. I mean, uh, you know, I think Robert Brenner is talking now about how essentially certain firms that are have strategic political power are capable of keeping themselves going, uh, not by any kind of profitable activity, but simply getting one subsidy after another. Uh, uh, how long do you think something like that can go on? Uh, or is that something that the only way that that breaks is when there is a kind of political revolution uh, against it rather than the business as usual that keeps going on? I mean, the number of subsidies that have been handed out in the last, I don't know, since the financial crisis, uh, you know, beggar the imagination you know, with no with no kind of uh, political rebound. So I wonder what your take is on that. <laughs> do, well, do you have a, well, you know, you can see, for example, at the present time, there's an enormous subsidization of the armaments industry. So everybody, so everybody in Europe and. America is very excited about the war in Ukraine. They're making gigantic amounts of money from it. But of course, none of this helps with the development of uh, capitalist profitability. This is all money which is taken out of the system, handed to Lockheed or Grumman or to some bomb maker in Belgium, and then it just gets dumped in, in, uh, in Ukraine or Russia and destroyed. So they can continue to, to uh, you, you could see in the current debt negotiations in the United States. You say, oh no, we have, to, we have to support the military. So that's what you're talking about. That's a subsidization of selected corporations. But of course, somebody else, everybody else has to pay for it. So that means they're not gonna be building more highways. They're not gonna build bridges. They're not going to, they probably won't even be able to subsidize chip factories. You know, they're not gonna have a green revolution. So all the, the, it's, it's like, if, you know, the wealthy countries will eventually become, they are now becoming more and more like the poor countries. If you look at a country like Egypt, which is a very underdeveloped, small uh, economy, you have this enor enormous amount of poverty. That's because all of the money has to go to 10 people who all want to have a apartments in London and a house in, in the Hamptons and to be able to go to Gestad to go skiing if they ever have any snow again and so forth. So it's just like that here, that the, the people who have been, uh, invested in Grumman or will, will uh, collect a lot of money. But in the meantime, all the people who invested in real estate trusts and who, who have, are looking to see their uh, leases in commercial real estate renewed in the next 10 years in American cities, they're not going to get any money. Those real estate trusts are all going to go broke. All those pension funds that have all their money invested in, in commercial real estate, that money is just going to disappear. So Grumman will make money, but the economy will continue to collapse. And the, the parts that aren't subsidized will collapse faster because of the subsidization. So the more money they get pumped into making shells for Ukraine, uh, the less money there is to renew real estate leases in San Francisco and New York. So we, what you have is a distribution of a, of a, of a declining pool of money among a declining pool of people on a global scale. So how long it will take before people can't stand it anymore, it, it's, it's very hard to know. And you, you can already, you know, people, you can see, like I live in San Francisco at the moment, the ruling class of San Francisco is really disturbed that there's no money. And this is a very rich city. This is the center of the tech. You know, there's like, a, they're 
creating AI around me as I speak. Artificial intelligence is booming. Money is flowing in, but the banks are collapsing. The real estate is collapsing. You know, so there's a small handful of companies that are collecting, like NVIDIA is collecting a trillion dollars, but everybody else who bought, you know, who spent a trillion dollars buying buildings has now lost that trillion dollars. So that's okay. the problem. Let me push oh, back yeah. on that or I mean, reframe it. Are you saying, for example, uh, that there's no place to get a return and then what you hear a lot, for example, is one of the problems, uh, one of the reasons that all the synthetic derivatives and things were were created was literally with all the money that came into the world that the banks were printing and uh, uh, both private and, and government and the, the go-go Clinton years, there weren't a lot of places to put it to get a big return, particularly when they started to take uh, the interest rate down. So it's yeah. more... Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm I mean, sorry, you're right. Isn't it more a case that, well, there's a lot of money around, but there's nowhere for it to go because everything that was profitable is becoming less and less profitable. And unless you have strategic power within the political system to sort of extort subsidies towards what you're doing, it's very hard to go play even a straight Keynesian investment game and, and, and make the kind of money you were making before. Yes, except that it's not even money, it's credit. Well, it's not even real money. It's just it's just some paper money <laughs> that, that, that has been invented. So that's the problem. And, and credit works great if you can pay it back in the future. But that's at the moment, you could, so from what just, I, I was, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but you can even see in China, which is sort of the, the most, was the most dynamic part of the world economy. But the engine of the Chinese prosperity is real estate is speculation. It's not even, it's not even production. It's real estate speculation, which is now all collapsing. Uh, I, I find the idea that you say that the people who are running the system don't understand how it works, uh, both plausible and horrifying, uh, <laughs> particularly with all the aggression, you know, the, uh, or at least, well, let's put it another way, that the system is so fragmented that there's a whole national security part of the system that knows nothing about economics or the, the, the interdependence of the world that is trying to go back to the Cold War and make aggressive gestures and uh, get the U.S. ready to fight three wars, uh, three adversaries, or two and a half, or whatever the fuck the the number is. You know that they literally uh, there are people who keep pushing this for one reason. Maybe there are a few others who are believers in military Keynesianism who think it's going to be good for the economy and so forth. But uh, uh, the notion of why the economy is having trouble and whether it can go it alone into nationalism, as Jamie is going to uh, destroy when his book comes out. I mean, it's a, it's a strange notion of how uh, unconnected one part of the government is to the other, it seems, you know. Uh, so... Uh, uh, and the idea of going it alone is not, uh, I mean, they say, I mean, that's not really what they have in mind, right? They want to maintain a hierarchy uh, in, right. the, in the world right. system. And they want to maintain the United States position at the top of the hierarchy. And right. that means not letting places below be, be places that get to appropriate surplus for themselves, right? They want they want the surplus to to flow towards the United States, and that maintain and that means not letting China uh, move to the edge of the scientific, technological, innovative envelope, right? Uh, and China was it was doing low skilled work on a massive scale for U.S. capital, but as it moved up the value chain, started competing against the areas where we have the you know competitive advantage. That's that's when it all turned. Uh, that's when they made that 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 turn. So <laughs> uh, I don't think anybody really thinks the United States is ever going to be completely autonomous in the in the world market. It, it's I mean that's not really the project, right? The right. project is to maintain 
I mean, Jamie goes into this in a lot of detail, maintain a, and it's an imperialist project, right? Uh, there's a global pool of value that's created out there in the world. And the point is to have US capital get the biggest share of that possible. Uh, and intellectual property rights are one way to do that. Uh, subsidizing our leading firms is one way to do that. Uh, but that's that's the project. Let me let me just uh, play devil's advocate on this to go back I, because I'd love to hear your answers to this. Uh, there's an interesting uh, book called Planetary Mind uh, by Martin Arboleda uh, from Verso, which I think is really wonderful. Uh, and what he says, I, so much of uh, economic policy uh, has been formulated in national terms as if there's a constituent, a very strong constituent in the U.S. that wants to build up the quality of the nation rather than uh, a bunch of people with money who are happy to uh, belong to the nation where, where they don't pay taxes, but figure out other places to be when it comes time for taxes. That is, they're always in search of relative surplus value around the world rather than the wealth of their particular nation. How does that contradiction uh, play out together from the people who really, uh, uh, people who push the idea of American power from just a habit from 50 years of Cold War or something to other people who are saying, oh, I'll move to Hong Kong if they, or, or New Zealand and invest from there if I'm going to take all the money there. You know, that's a, is that a conflict that we're going to see play out uh, among cap, fractions of capital in the future? I couldn't really hear you, Philip. What was the, what's the the conflict that you're describing? Uh, the conflict between uh, uh, people who are habituated to a Cold War notion of uh, economics being for making the nation powerful, as opposed to people who have been really. Uh, schooled in globalization and see it the search of, for relative surplus value as what drives their particular uh, activities in every facet of life, even if it includes taking citizenship in Hong Kong at some time or hiding in New Zealand. That is to say, basically, when it comes to that, it's where is the money going to uh, turn over best? And, you know, I really don't care how, uh, uh, how, how, uh, strong the nation gets, unless I need it for making money. That's what I'm saying. Is there a contradiction there that could play out in the future? Yeah, I think I would, I mean, I, within just with the U.S. state, I think, and with the broader ruling class, there, there has been a lot of jockeying in recent, in, in recent years, I, I, would, I would argue, and really over the last 10 years or so, where the the you know the, the the internationalists the 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 rootless cosmopolitans like the you know the a lot of the richest people and investors based in the U.S. have kind of lost that international mindset that you're describing, Philip, or or at least they've been they've lost out to the the wings of the cap of the of the capitalist class and of of the ruling class who are more interested in enlisting the the support of the nation state. The full power of the U.S. government on their side to prosecute, right, the global war, the economic war on their behalf. So, uh, you know, Paul mentioned the Nvidia tech CEO talking about the the need to access China's mark, continue to access China's market. But there's also a wing of tech capital that is very, very militaristic about the confrontation with China because they because China is now about to outcompete the U.S. on things like AI and computational technology, and you know, not to mention the the, the green manufacturing like sort of post carbon technology stuff, but just on the like the highest end of the value chain stuff, right? Like China is competing with the U.S. now, and you know, Silicon Valley is the still very much like a goose that lays the golden eggs for the U.S. economy, and is a huge part of its its the intellect the global intellectual property regime. You know that that like allows it to to absorb so much of the world's wealth. You know, Silicon Valley is a a, a major pillar of that regime, and so they a lot of not all of them, but a lot of the the sort of tech 
Northern California or it's California elite have come around to wanting to to take this much more aggressive and like containment centered stance towards towards China. And so they're enlisted in the new Cold War. And then there are, you know, there are, I think, like manufacturing companies, like older companies like Caterpillar, you know, that build construction equipment that are very concerned about losing access to the to China's market. Like a lot of these older industrial companies are not happy about being pushed, you know, shoved out of China's market by local competitors. And they 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 want the U.S. state to help them basically resubordinate China back into a lower position where they'll, they'll have more open access to China's market to sell our imports and, or our, our exports and so on. So their profits can be sustained. So I think there's been a lot of there, there's just been a lot of flux within the ruling class on the like the old school, like classic neoliberal kind of perspective on, you know, trade is good for everyone. We need to be able to trade across borders transnationally. And that's, you know, they don't want capital controls or any of that shit getting in their way versus the, you know, the, the block of that class that is increasingly interested in exactly those kinds of controls and exactly those kinds of policies and prosecuting the kinds of trade wars that we've seen uh, that will be on their behalf right by the state over the last seven or eight years. Does that make sense? You're muted. <laughs> Can't hear you, Phil. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. and, and also realizing how much they depend on the favorable global legal design for things like international property or being able to sue uh, other countries when they do environmental uh, uh, gestures for interfering with profit and so forth. I'm going to take a couple of questions from here. Some of them I'm sure you've heard before in, in many of your uh, appearances, uh, but I'll read them anyway. What do you think of Bitcoin? Um. It, it's speculative play. <laughs> people have well. The first thing I think Bitcoin is not money. Bitcoin is an is an artificially generated asset class, basically, which has prevented, which has provided scope for a, a large number of Ponzi schemes and uh, fraudulent enterprises, and which uh, is probably sort of on the way out. Because, but you know, there's always as as long as there as, as long as there is a as long as there are ways to imaginative ways to defraud people there are people who are happy to be defrauded because they hope that they can make money in some magical way and then there are other people who are glad to take their money so but basically it's it was one of those uh you know it it they, it, it flourished because of the low interest regime in which there was huge amounts of money to be invested in all kinds of crap and so people but like gold is but people are buying gold like crazy now or they were buying uh, art or buying re real estate in all over the world so somebody somebody the people who invented it actually had a kind of cockamamie idea of an alternative to the money system which would not be under the control of central banks and so it was a kind of libertarian a, a nutty libertarian idea but the only reason it flourished is it provided material for uh, a huge amount of of uh, speculation and ponzi scheming as far as i can tell um but right. it's it's a, it's a minor phenomenon for uh of people who have extra for people who have extra cash and don't mind losing it. So another version of GameStop and with musical chairs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, now here's another one. <laughs> it's an interesting ideological phenomenon because there it is connected to all those people who, you know, sort of a tech tech ideology of of the individual entrepreneur who can somehow be independent of governmental institutions. It, it's a weird, you know, it's, it's a weird ideological twist, but it is of no deep economic importance, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to read a question that would probably take about four hours to answer, but I would love to read it just because uh, 
Can you describe what system you would prefer instead of capitalism that will save us all? Communism. <laughs> One central <laughs> Or you can call it anarchism or socialism if you want, but that's the most meaningless of all words. All right. Obviously, to develop that <laughs> and explain what it is would take a very long time. But thank you for your... Uh, <laughs> I just got to say, sorry to interrupt, Phil, but I got to log off. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was great talking with you today. Yeah. Well, nice to see you. I, I got knocked out. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie. It was, uh, it's really great always. And I'm looking, I'll be looking for that book. Yeah, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> All right. Take care, Paul. Tony. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Driving down, I hate to... What do you think? I'm, I, you know, there are some questions that might take a, a fair. A, how do? Oh, yeah. How do you explain that I can trade one Bitcoin for a lot of money if it has no value? Well, <laughs> I think we've gone into that. Marx did say that's the transition period of non-transferable labor voucher, vouchers, but that's a far cry from modern monetary theory or Proudhon's labor money much less bitcoin well i think we'd all agree with that anyway uh, is some sort of global centralization inevitable one island of the capitalist core in hong kong and a worldwide periphery the global centralization is already happening there are, there's a very small number of corporations that dominate the world economy and they are transnational corporations. So uh, this is not a this is not a, a speculation about the future. It is we already live in a highly concentrated, centralized right. transnational system in which a very small transnational class, which runs, you know, I don't know, there may be a hundred corporations really are the most are, are basically running the world economy. So that already has happened. Right. Okay. And in a way, it goes back to. Sorry. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, in a way, it goes back to the very. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the, the beginning discussion of what money is. I mean, the one thing that money does is it makes everything it touches commensurable, and so in principle, it it, it doesn't it doesn't recognize any borders, right? You might have your money, I might have my money, but money is going to be inherently commensurable, and so we'll get an exchange rate that will connect. The two money systems. Uh, way, I mean, I mean, this is a point Marx made. The unit of capitalism has been the world market from day one because it's bound together mm -hmm. by money, and money makes commensurate across borders. Uh, it's like the perverse form of universal solidarity. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like we should have solidarity across borders because solidarity, any bar, any border is arbitrary to solidarity. Any any border to money is arbitrary. Uh, it's it's <laughs> so anyway. I'm I'm agreeing with Paul. <laughs> the centralization okay, yeah. of different I, national I economies into a world market is an old story. Uh, someone says Marx's entire analytic system relies on commodity money, and therefore cannot be a master signifier to explain contemporary fiat monetary and digital financial. Systems. You want to, the, to, to really it. answer that would take a long time, but the short answer is <laughs> that's just wrong. Uh, Marx, Marx assumes that money is a commodity in the three volumes of capital, but and particularly in the first volume. But in the first volume, there is no credit system. There are no banks. He is he's dealing with a highly abstracted, imaginary version of capitalism, uh, and in which he he as uh, as it simplifies his argument greatly to treat money as a commodity. But Marx knew perfectly well that capitalist money is not a commodity. He says so over and over. He says that the credit is the is the form of money that capitalism invented for itself. And uh, even you could say that Marx still thought, because it was true at his time, that there was still a role for the commodity 
for the money commodity in international trade. So, so he had the idea that gold could still function as world money, even though on his period of time, it already didn't function. There was no commodity money in, in nationally. The gold standard was constantly being suspended. And he, you could even see that how artificial the gold standard was, that it was a, the, the values of gold and the relation between gold and the different currencies was already manipulated by governments and central banks. But it's, that's simply, that's a mistake. And it's because people don't understand that capital is not a general theory of capitalist society or even of the capitalist economy. It's a book about capital. It's not even a book about wage labor or a book about landed property. And it's certainly not a book about money. So, so his, he was going to get to the credit system and to banking in the last of his seven volumes that he intended to write, of which he only wrote the first part of the first volume. So this is a this is a mistake that it, it's very easy to fall into it because Marx does assume in volume one of Capital that money is a commodity, but he says quite explicitly, of course, as soon as money begins comes into existence, its commodity nature and its money nature begin to separate because the minute you handle a gold coin, it begins to wear away, and the value of the coin is now the value that's printed on it, not the actual value of the gold. So Marx would see that even when you had commodity money, it wasn't really commodity money, but was al already had an artificial paper-like aspect. So this is, this is just a mistake that almost everybody says that about Marx, but it's not true. So, could, I, could I just add a little bit to that? Oh. Sure, absolutely. I would let you go yeah. Well, I mean, as I understand it, Marx's theory of money is just the statement that generalized commodity production requires a general, a general, a generalized equivalent, right? That the, exactly. The, the thing about capitalism is that production is undertaken privately, and so unlike other social systems, where from the beginning, if you produce something, you know it will be used in society, it has a social purpose. In money, in, in capitalism, production is undertaken privately, and then you have to prove that that production has a social function, and you prove it through sale for money. And if all commodities are proved their social necessity through sale, then there has to be some general equivalent that is, a, is the socially recognized way of validating that the private production was socially necessary. So money is that thing that serves as the general equivalent. And that and it can be anything, right? It can be absolutely anything, as long as there is an understanding that this is the general proof that the product uh, is socially needed. Uh, so not it's not necessarily tied to a commodity, right? It's completely open-ended what it could be, as long as it's so something. To go back to on. One of Tony's articles from years ago, uh, Marx inaugurated a scientific research program as opposed to uh, providing us with some golden tablets from heaven. Uh, that research program is still going on, uh, completing those five, four volumes that Marx didn't uh, complete, but people are chipping away at on things that are being published by historical materialism and monthly review. It's, a, it's an unfinished notion, some of these things. So, so uh, there's no dogma here that we're doing this. We're trying to refine, you know, I, I guess that one story about somebody saying to Marx, you probably know the exact, aren't you finished with capital now, 1857? <laughs> wait, wait, there's a depression coming. I got to finish this and see what happens. <laughs> so we're all in that position. I think it's a good point to uh, to stop. I want to thank you always. Paul, it's always illuminating uh, to have you on, on Red May. And, uh, to, and to read field notes. I, I do encourage people to read field notes in the Brooklyn Rail. It's online. It's really the best thing going for bringing kind of uh, deep thought into the present conjuncture. Uh, and Tony Smith, uh, great finally to meet you and have you, Red May. Hopefully we'll have you back. Great. Thank you thank very you much. Bill. Thank you, Tony. It was yeah. fun. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, uh, let me just say tomorrow is a day off. Wow. Uh, but uh, Tuesday is uh, uh, Tuesday is late fascism at 11 a.m. with Alberto Toscana, Robin Morasco, and Nikhil Pal Singh. And Wednesday, we have the legal crisis in Chile also at 11 a.m. Uh, see you then. Thanks very much.